<laughs> okay. Uh, so, um, so we have our Libreverse here uh, and students can access it in a variety of different ways. So one is just directly going to our content uh, and that is one of the most available uh, uh, or accessible regions out there. So anyone who teaches chemistry, for example, and has ever Googled any topic in chemistry cannot come across the Libre text in the top searches of things, they, just because chemistry is the most mature of our libraries because I'm a chemistry uh, faculty member. And of course, it's the best field that anyone should be studying um, uh, out there. So <clears throat> students can access these things directly. Uh, we're working on ways in order to tie this thing together in a more effective manner using the learning management systems and essential uh, sign-on. Uh, but students can also interact with our material through learning management systems. Um, in, in company of that. We're still at the initial stages of that using common cartridges, but there are LTI and other protocols that we have uh, or are in the process of establishing off of that. So uh, a guiding principle behind, we, uh, uh, behind what we're doing here with the way that we have this thing set up uh, <clears throat> with everything that's integrated here is to have, uh, is to stop, is to build the textbook of the future, right? And so the textbook of the future uh, involves a lot of other components off of here, but one of the problems that the textbook of the past or the current textbook is, is that it focuses on, uh, it, it acts as a silo. Uh, it, it is a self-contained infrastructure that things are put into and that you distribute out. And, it's, and that by itself is perfectly fine because we teach in silos. The problem is that we, we want the students to learn the interconnection of content stored in the different silos. So far too often the same concept is taught in different fields using different terminology and different examples off of there. And it, they're not connected very well because they're uh, in the resources that we give to students because there is very little connection between these, uh, these things when we give out individual books. Moreover, if you don't have one book uh, in your library uh, as a student, you're unable to make those connections off of that. So I think that we should stop visualizing or, or pushing the development of individual books as the ultimate goal, and we should be building individual text libraries, an infrastructure that, that shows the connection of what we're trying to address and what we want our students to, uh, uh, to envision so that the knowledge that they have learned is more than just the sum of the parts, that the synergy is much greater. Uh, and we can't instill that effectively as educators if we don't give them the resources that reflects that synergy, that interconnection. So we want to build things together as a text library that's heavily interconnected and that you can relate and balance between one topic to another topic as needed in order to be able to uh, pursue our education. Okay, so that was a longer philosophy approach of where we're going, what we're doing, what we fit, where we fit into the greater OER project or the greater OER universe. Uh, so let me get into a little bit more nitty gritty details associated with the Libre text uh, uh, as, a, uh, as a project. So again, let's go back to the math uh, uh, library. We have these two components. We have the courses where I said you have the customized areas that as faculty that are interested in customize your book, um, uh, you can do so by just requesting an account and building uh, it within uh, the course area. Uh, and the bookshelves are the ones that we curate and move forward. We are integrating thousands of OER pages per week uh, in order to make it so that you don't have to worry about editing and moving it forward. So this is in the chemistry library. Each library has a, a different organization of the bookshelves because we try to organize it around the fields of those, sort of, those specific libraries. So for chemistry, we've organized it in eight different components. Physics has its own different organization and social sciences is even more extended because the, uh, the breadth of topics that are in the social sciences. Um, and then you can peruse the content semantically uh, is meant to be organized that way. We do have the ability in order to do searches uh, and we're going to be augmenting our searches to be very powerful in the near future in order to be able to discover content from a search perspective, not from a semantic perspective. But again, the key point of going back to that text library argument is if you want to facilitate the organization of knowledge in faculty and students and see how things are connected. You want to present things semantically so they're able to see how things are organized, not just basically provide dis discovery via search as the primary mechanism in order to be able to do it, because you want to imprint into students how things are organized. So then if you switch to the courses, uh, individual campuses have specific courses, and then if you click on the individual uh, campus uh, course hubs, which we have here, you have individual faculty or individual classes and it's organized in a variety of different ways uh, in order to move that forward. Again, this is 
curated by the faculty, not by the development team, because that is the purview and the intent of the customization component. Um, getting back to the authoring infrastructure, uh, you can construct content in Word files and upload to our site or Google Doc and upload to our site. And that's perfectly fine. And that's a comfort zone that you have that's available. Um, but we also have the ability in order to edit content directly on our site. Uh, and it uses an editor called the CK editor. Uh, for those of you that uh, are familiar with uh, Canvas, uh, the Canvas learning management system uses the CK editor in order to edit the content on a page. So if you can edit in Canvas, you can edit on the LibreText. Uh, but you can also notice here that this uh, editing bar here is very similar to the editing bar in Word and very similar to the editing bar in uh, Google Doc because those things are essentially the same thing. They're a front end and, and writing stuff on the back end that's either HTML or XML depending upon um, which system that you're dealing with. Um, you can look at the underlying HTML code because this is a website, but you don't have to. So if HTML scares you, which I understand it scares me, scared me for many years, uh, you can just use a GUI interface off of there. And there are a few additional features that are unique uh, to the LibreText project that you have on here. Um, and there are a few additional features here that I would love to have on my Word uh, document that I, I cry for. I don't call it that. So, um, <clears throat> so part of the aspect of uh, constructing of content uh, is to be able to capitalize on advanced features. Um, and again, this will be going into more detail uh, tomorrow. Uh, so some of the advanced features that we have available, these technologies that we've implemented or we've built uh, off you, includes things like interactive molecules, interactive proteins via uh, a handful of different uh, technologies, uh, interactive three-dimensional structures. Uh, 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 I mentioned uh, the ability to embed execution code via the Jupyter Hub infrastructure. Uh, so this is Python that's added into it. We can use R if you're uh, doing um, uh, statistics, for example, uh, or in engineering, you bounce back and forth with Octave and Julia. And we actually have 30 other languages that we can integrate uh, available. We have an annotation infrastructure, so you can actually write on virtual marginalia on the side of your, uh, your pages, or you can use that as your virtual chat room or contextual chat room so that students can go in and write and highlight a specific paragraph, a specific equation, and then write down, I don't understand what this equation means, or I don't understand what this paragraph means. And then you can provide a contextual meta discussion on the side of your book. Um, and it's a more powerful chat room than what your learning management system provides. Uh, and we have two technologies in order to do that. One's hypothesis and the other one is nota bene, which is a precursor to a hypothesis. Um, so let me mention a little bit about the utility of, uh, of uh, learning the power of a community. So <clears throat> the OER community moves forward in part because when one person builds something and shares it with everyone, other people can capitalize and use it as a Lego block in order to build what you're going on. So this is an example of something that was uh, posted on Twitter. Uh, so this uh, individual free radical, and I don't know what his, his real name is, created a Python code for uh, identifying how to uh, distill isopropanol from isobutanol because I, I also follow chem Twitter. Um, and this code is available. I can grab it and I can embed it into my, my book and provide the opportunity in order to let uh, students interact with these things. And I can then modify and edit it in order to have different problems and different interactions. That is the ability in order to capitalize on what other people are doing and moving forward, the community that we're uh, very much trying to grow uh, and use effectively. So I mentioned harvesting uh, out there. As, uh, and harvesting, again, was the term that I used in order to take existing OER subject to the permissions of OER uh, and integrate it into our platform, into the living library that you have access to in order to construct your system. Uh, <clears throat> in order to do that, uh, and this is going to be the first hands-on uh, workshop, is how to remix a content. The first step is to build a remixing map and understand how it's set up. Use this technology we call the remixer in order to make it much easier to combine slice and dice content. Uh, and then you can continually re and edit it and, and move that forward. Before we do that, uh, this is this is enabled by the size of our OER content. Again, these three hundred thousand pages of OER that's out there that 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 we have on our con uh, that we have within our library. The bigger our library is, the more powerful and easier it is for you to find what you want and what you need in order to build what you're doing. So you don't have to build everything from scratch. Again, the whole goal of remixing an OER in general. Uh, so I have a team of about 70 to 80 undergraduate students uh, uh, on my campus, and their job is to scavenge OER, 
uh, and harvest it within our site. Uh, and some of that involves existing OER content. Some of it involves finding content that faculty have made and requesting that they donate it to us and make it OER for everyone to move forward. Uh, so we have a, a dual approach in order to do that. Uh, they edit and typeset things to a central standard, uh, and then they also cross-reference content. So if things are uh, interrelated uh, from different topics on different pages, you can actually hyperlink them in order to make them together. It applies meta tags in order to be able to, to have a central framework. Those meta tags will include a framework of uh, learning objectives, but also framework of terminology that's used in, in the glossary infrastructure. And then we built the OER uh, remixer in order to facilitate that. So this is uh, an upshot of the OER remixer. Uh, it is a simple drag and drop tool. In fact, it's the only tool of this power. And it's enabled not just because of the technology of the OER remixer, which is relatively simple, but the back end of having access to 30, 300,000 pages of OER. So you have the ability to drag and drop content from the library panel into the remix panel to make a new book. Uh, and you can do that and you can organize that and you can renumber and rename and do a variety of different features that uh, Josh will be discussing uh, momentarily. Uh, and it provides a mechanism uh, to, uh, to rapidly build uh, a content instead of having to slice and dice things individually, which is a painful process uh, to do. I mentioned learning analytics. So one of the utilities of building this Libreverse uh, as a learning platform for students to actually interact with and start to say, well, here's some homework. Here's a problem that's embedded into my, my page. Here I want to uh, interact with executable code or something like that, is that provides an opportunity in order to provide analytics back to the instructor. Yeah. So most learning management systems have some metric of learning learning analytics available for these things. We want, uh, and we are currently building analytics in order to empower faculty in order to guide their pedagogy by how the students are interacting with the material. Um, so for, uh, and that is an exceedingly powerful mechanism in order to I, capitalize how students interact with the textbook, interact with the homework system and build this infrastructure. And it's all set up so appropriate FERPA and rules like that. And we're not selling data or anything like that because it's not our game. This is meant in order to give this information back to the instructor. So this is an example of these sort of analytics. So about six years ago, I taught two back-to-back -back classes um, of 500 students in order to demonstrate the efficacy of the Libre text, actually the Kim Wiki, which was the, the term of the project back then. Uh, and this right here is aggregate daily page views in one of my classes. Uh, and what you can see is at the start of the class, uh, students study uh, or read content in the beginning, they decayed away with about a half or about a week half-life. Um, and they're studying uh, per uh, per day is roughly kind of flat here until right before the first exam and then it accelerates uh, tenfold and then it drops uh, and students are then um, doing their equivalent of post-election uh, crying uh, and then they start studying again and then you have another uh, cram another cram session so the idea of cramming is not new to us uh, and we probably also dealt with it when we were students uh, ourselves but uh, this provides a metric in order to guide the impact of cramming on students performance both on the exams, but also on a longitudinal uh, basis for subsequent classes. Uh, and the idea behind that is that you can then use this as a metric to guide the pedagogy of how we instruct in order to build something better uh, to advance that. And this was an example of it the subsequent quarter uh, in the summer where uh, I taught a weekly uh, quiz, I gave weekly quizzes instead of uh, three week uh, exams in order to try to get the base baseline up. Just for your information, you could find this in the chemistry education research and practice uh, study right here. The crammers did about 10 uh, performed about 10 percent poorer than the non crammers. Um, so, um, accessibility. <clears throat> we have uh, a need in order to uh, advance accessibility on our content because uh, a we should be doing, and b we should be legally we are legally obligated to do that. Uh, and so we have bots. So because we have everything centralized and we have control of things uh, uh, on our platform, we can implement programs that go page by page and implement changes to the content. So when people build content on our site or contribute content to our site, these bots will go through and start to update them. And we have two bots out there. One is the Brad bot. And the Brad bot is meant in order to go to pages and do a, uh, a range of different checks and modifications and stuff like that, that largely are aesthetic uh, in order to be able to address big issues. They essentially prettify or make that those pages pretty. So it's named after Brad Pitt circa three decades ago and because it's a pretty 
because he's pretty. Uh, <clears throat> and he comes in and the Brad bot moves out and does like that. It doesn't do any substantive changes to the content. It just makes the code a little bit more consistent uh, across the board. Then the alley bot for accessibility comes in and starts to do all the accessibility requirements uh, because we've standardized the code from the Brad bot in order to make it so we can do the things that we can do uh, with a bot. Okay, there's still some things that require human intervention in order to be able to, to address that, like alt text and other things like that. Uh, and then they, um, uh, and the bot comes in and just uh, changes it. So it's not a checker, which is quite common, for example, in, in learning management system. It's a doer. It comes in and implements uh, those things, adds things, and it provides us an opportunity in order to curate the content to handle emerging accessibility uh, standards, because the standards are constantly evolving as we're moving forward off of that. We're very excited about that. We just started testing this thing out on a local scale before starting to open this thing up across the site uh, off of these things. These are the only two bots that run uh, or, or, or deal with our curation of individual faculties uh, books in the courses under the arguments that we have a requirement in order to make things either as pretty as possible, but certainly as uh, accessible as possible uh, for your content. Um, so um, I mentioned the homework system. Uh, this is just meant to scare you with various uh, snippets of things like that. There's a lot of details associated. One of the key aspects behind our uh, homework system is to integrate existing technologies and not and because different technologies out there have utilities in different fields. Uh, so the three ones that we have focused initially on uh, is I'm uh, IMath AS, which is the same technology that underlies uh, MyOpenMath, also the same technology that underlies OM uh, in Lumen. Uh, <clears throat> um, WebWork, uh, which is a precursor to MyOpenMath, which is uh, useful, used a lot in upper divisional math classes, engineering, and other things, whilst MyOpenMath is more uh, popular in the lower divisional community colleges level. Uh, and then H5P. Uh, which is a emerging technology that is more graphical oriented, less algorithmic, which gives the ability in order to move things around and, and, and such like that. Uh, and then there's several other technologies that we're looking at in order to expand and to build uh, into this infrastructure. And the idea is to bring us all together and have the same unified approach in order to do that. And that's our query library. So if you go to query.libretext.org, you can see these 100,000 problems of existing problems that have been cultivated or, uh, from these different databases that you have access to in order to be able to, to find it. Uh, it's a little hard in order to find things because it's not semantically organized in the same way that uh, our libraries are, but you can do searches in order to find content on meta tags and such like that. And again, that'll be discussed in more detail tomorrow morning. Um, the ADAPT homework system is the ability in order to use these things summatively, not just integrating it into your pages formatively, and provide an opportunity in order to implement culturally responsive pedagogy and teaching, um, and this adaptive learning infrastructure around decision trees with some machine learning slash AI in order to guide uh, advanced remediation needs for students so that we don't have to act as tutors for each of our students, um, because we typically don't have the time in order to be able to do that. Um, so um, it, there are a few dissemination mechanisms, and then I'm going to end this. Uh, uh, one that's uh, out there is that we're going to be releasing these uh, portals, which gives us a mechanism in order to be able to do searches on individual uh, campuses or individual um, systems. So this is a portal for College of the Canyons, uh, which is a community college down in Southern California. Uh, and these are... Uh, uh, you know, 15 of 31 books that they have available that you can click in order to identify it. When you click that, uh, uh, you have the ability in order to view content online. You can get a PDF of the entire book. You can get the LMS files for integrating into your learning management system. Uh, you can get individual zip files, and you can also have the option of buying the book. Uh, and this is an option that we have available. So any book that's put into our system and that we have compiled, meaning that we've cleaned it up and it reaches our standards, then uh, you have the ability as a faculty member or as a student in order to just purchase the printing at, at, on demand. Um, so we take the money and push it off to the printer uh, and you can buy a book. This is my general chemistry book uh, and this costs $12 plus shipping. Uh, in contrast to multiple hundreds of dollars out there. So for people uh, and students that want physical copies instead of online copies, this is a mechanism in order to, uh, to distribute that. 
you can really skip over that. Uh, <clears throat> another mechanism uh, that we have is the Libertex in a box. This is essentially a Raspberry Pi, which is a, a, a little mini computer uh, that acts as a hotspot. We can load these things with our entire libraries and distribute them to areas that have limited or no uh, Wi-Fi or internet capabilities. So for example, if you're in the middle of the mountains and you wanna study your chemistry, of course, everyone's been there. Uh, you can just, and you have a Wi-Fi access, uh, Wi-Fi accessible device. You can uh, load this thing up and access it. If you're in the middle of the ocean, in the military, underneath um, the uh, underneath the ocean, uh, or if you're in developing countries, this is a mechanism to distribute content effectively that does not require online access. We have a version in order to do this thing uh, using just the apps that are on phones, not just using a uh, a physical device of that, and we expect that to be coming out uh, very soon. So let me end this uh, with what I started, which is our mission. We're implementing a community-built OER research platform portal that's comprehensive and we can curate it at multiple levels. Uh, each of those C's means of various things. The key point is to get uh, as many people involved in order to build, curate, uh, distribute content as effectively, and that's one of the goals of the LibreFest itself. Uh, and with that, I thank you for your attention uh, and uh, I, I have some time in order to answer some questions before the next uh, entry uh, on this workshop. Yeah, you don't have to ask permission to ask a question. Just unmute yourself and ask. Henry, if you're speaking, I can't hear you. Yeah. yeah. Um, Delmar, do you have either a print book or a LibreText in a box just on hand to show? No, um, not not at home. Um, so I'm surprised, though. Okay. Uh, are you talking about the size? You want to show the size that fits in the palm of your hand, or uh, is there a specific? Yeah. No. So it it's like that big. If you can see my my screen here, uh, and Henry might have one. I'm not sure. Actually, um, do a, I do uh, have my. Um... And you can distribute content uh, either via SD cards or there's one, or you can connect it to the internet. Um, uh, and download it there. We're switching the technology a little bit. There are a handful of them that are being exposed right here. Um, and they cost about $50 because it's hardware in order to distribute. Uh, and we're very excited in order to use this in order to, um, uh, to expand the Libre text and the utility of the content that we have to developing countries, uh, which again is one of the, everyone's showing their, uh, their um, Raspberry Pi and I don't have <laughs> one but sort of left out here um, uh, yeah, and, and such, so. Um, are they ready now? Someone's asking. What was that? Can can people get the LibreTex in a box now? That's a question that been asked. Yeah, we need to uh, put it on our um, um, our bookstore that you you see online. Uh, but yes, they're 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 available now. Uh, I I would recommend waiting a few uh, months before asking for it because we want to update a, to a different technology. So it's the same technology that's for the LibreTex on the phone app. So you can download it and it's interconverted. So it's not two different technologies and that they don't uh, interact very well on it. Um, we expect to uh, in next year uh, really push this hard because again, this is useful for uh, developing countries, which is what we're working with. But there are a lot of students uh, in America that have limited internet access um, uh, and, and, and such. Um, you can power them off a uh, solar cell array. Very inexpensive. <laughs>